And we are back for documenting in real time a conversation with Steve James. Steve James is a name synonymous with documentary. Some of his credits include Hoop Dreams, Stevie, Real Paradise, At the Death House Door, The Interrupters, Head Games, Life Itself. His latest work, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, is playing here at the festival. He joins us to discuss his rich career, the craft of documenting an unfolding story where the outcome was unknown, and to share some wise words with filmmakers. He is joined on stage by Tom Powers. We are going to start with the clip.
halfway through, so uh, please be ready with your questions. Um, I, I want to talk about the art of following a story, which you've done with Hoop Dreams, with The Interrupters, and, uh, and so many other films, and you're doing it in this film again, Abacus. You enter the story while uh, this family, the Sun family, who we see, are on trial. Before. We're not going to tell you how the film ends, mm -hmm. um, but I do want to kind of understand how you work through the, through the process of this. So maybe, when did you enter the story? It, well, we entered the story um, as the trial was getting going. And um, I had heard about the story from Mark Mitten, the producer, who was friends with the Sung family. And it's good I heard about it from Mark because no one was writing about it unless you read the Chinese American press, which you don't. I, I don't. Um, and so it was, um, so that was when we started. And, um, in, in this case, it was really helpful that Mark had this pre-existing relationship with the Sungs because it immediately put us in a, a, a not, not just in a good place for them to accept us coming into film, but also to kind of build that kind of trust very quickly that was, I think, necessary in order to tell the story. Do they sit at home and watch Hoop Dreams the way they do It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> exactly. I don't think anyone watches Hoop Dreams anymore. But, um, <laughs> but... I, I don't know how many of my films they'd seen, or if they'd seen any of my films, honestly. Uh, but they at least knew of the titles okay. of some of the films. So, and Mark had talked it up enough, it helped. You're the guy who never wins an Oscar, they, they said. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so, so, you get in with the Sun family, and, uh, and a trial is unfolding, and in your head, you know, does it matter what the outcome is, or is, I mean, sometimes trials stretch out long. Did, did you have an idea when you started that, okay, this is gonna be over by May, right, right. or whatever? No, I mean, the trial went considerably longer than anyone would have expected, except the prosecution. Um, you know, I think that we, I think that we had an assumption during the trial um, because of, of the way the Sungs felt about how it was going, and, and you know, we were not able to film in the courtroom so we had to solve that problem in, in filmmaking otherwise. Um, but there was a sense that they felt good about how it was going. And I think if you see the film, you sort of see that, at least in the way we have presented it to you, that they probably should have felt pretty good about it. It seemed like whatever the prosecution was presenting was, was, was answered well. Uh, so there was a sense that, that it was going to work out. I think that probably for them made them feel a little better about committing to this, not knowing what the outcome was going to be. Of course, we privately hope they would be found guilty because it just makes for a better film if, if, if that, you know, I mean. Sense of outrage. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to make a movie here. No. no. We were clearly pulling for them as well, but we did not know. And I think that though then when it, when, I think we can say this without, you know, that, that when the trial wrapped and the deliberation began, um, the length of that process gave everyone pause, mm -hmm. at least on this side of, of, of it. And, and so, um, but they, you know, I think that what's great about them is that they never wavered in letting us be there to, to document what they were going through. So I don't know if it occurred in, in this film, but maybe you could draw upon uh, other examples. Um, I'm curious what you do as a filmmaker when you hit that point where the, the people you're following have, you know, are it going through something very tough, and right. <clears throat> and and maybe despite whatever they promised you before about getting access, like the, enough is enough. They need they want to close the the, the door. Uh, do you have an experience like that, and and how you work through it? Well, I I haven't had experiences where people have told me that they want to stop filming and be done with the filming, um, like period. I didn't even mean that. I just meant yes, like a but in a situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had situations where, um, where people, you know, I've, I've actually, I'm trying to think of a good example of that, but I, I mean, I, I've had situations where in the moment it felt like too much, and, and I could sense that. And you were pulling, you were making and, that and, decision. And I might pull back some, you know, or, 
or they might say, you know, can you give, you know, get, you know, give me some space or whatever, and, and we absolutely we pull back in those situations. Um, I've been pretty fortunate, for the most part, um, in that I've been able to to film pretty much with a free hand uh, in some difficult situations. Um, I find that though that one of the keys I think to um, to making that happen is, and it's, it sounds a little paradoxical until you think about it, is, is that the more control your subjects have, subjects feel they have over this whole endeavor, the more they will let you hmm. do what you want to and do. So what does that mean that they have, feel control? Well, in other words, I, I, I really try to give this sense in, in filming, especially in some of the longer projects that, and more intense situations, that um, we're doing this together and that they can say no. That, that there are situations where you can say, look, um, I, I, I don't want to talk about that or I don't want you to film that and I will respect that. I say to them now, knowing me, I may try to change your mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I will respect mm -hmm. that decision. And uh, like for instance on the interrupters, um, one of the arrangements we had with our main subjects who were these, you know, people that were called violence interrupters that went around and tried to mediate violent conflict in the streets was is that we would step away from any situation where they felt like our presence had anything at all to do with, with making it harder for them to do their job. And, and, um, and sometimes I honored that. No. Well, I, <laughs> and, you know, and so they, they felt in control of that. And so they could then, um, they could then say, you know, this isn't, you know, this one I don't want you to come along on or, or whatever. Um, and, and I think so the more control they felt like they had, then the more they were willing to let me in because they realized that, that I would respect that. Um, like Amina Matthews in The Interrupters, we filmed with her a lot before I ever got into her actual home hmm. um, because she felt like that was a part of her life she did not want to share in this film for the longest time. And it, it kind of became a running joke between us. It was mm. like, Amina, when are you going to let me like see your house? Mm. Come on, when are we going to, you know? And it became, but it was a, but I respected it. And, it we, and, and then eventually she got to that place where she felt comfortable with that and we did come into her home. You know, as you're describing this, it occurs to me that I think you know, the, the biggest tool that any filmmaker has in their toolkit is their own personality. I mean, you describing that is a way of you using your own personality of being jokey and uh, warm and someone else is going to use a personality of being aggressive and pushing right. forward and someone else is going to use a personality of you know of kind of disappearing into the uh, in, right. into the woodwork um, yeah there are different approaches uh, I like to say that if you're a narrative filmmaker uh, you can be a complete asshole um, <laughs> and it actually might serve you well to be an asshole because everyone's like oh we better give him or her this because you don't want to deal with that. Yeah. But, um, but I do think that by and large in documentary, unless you're going to adopt the, the kind of fly on the wall approach of just standing in a corner and trying to be as inobtrusive as possible and capture things, um, which I could never do. Um, I'm just too much of a chatterbox. Okay, you've already ruined this as a soundbite. We, we, we need to condense. I need to edit this. Exactly. Because you started great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've already ruined it. So let's start over. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I mean, if you if if you want to be a narrative filmmaker, be oh yes, yeah, be an asshole. Um, <laughs> but if you want to make documentaries, it really helps to have your subjects like you. All right. There's the quote. There's the quote. <laughs> Should I leave now? See, <laughs> <laughs> because. They will think of reasons to not have you around if they don't like you, or if, if it's just, if it's hard, because it's, it's already hard in a way for them on some level to have this kind of alien thing happening. It may be flattering, it may be wonderful, um, it, it, and it may be even enjoyable, but it is, it is different, and so you, you, want, you want them to feel like they enjoy your company. I think, you know, like on The Interrupters, which, which in many ways was a film that was very, there was a lot of very painful things that you see in that film. We had more laughs on that film mm. uh, because the people we were following were such wonderfully humorous and funny people and we just so enjoyed being mm. around each other. But then when serious things happen, serious things happen. And it's true in Abacus also. You wouldn't yes. necessarily think that the family 
under uh, prosecution uh, could be so funny, but to the, but the Sun family is. They are. No, if, I think, you know, and this is true of a lot of documentaries, I feel like. It's like if you gave this story to uh, a screenwriter and said, go write this story, like it's just a piece of fiction. I don't think most of them would choose to portray the family as this sort of bickering, loving, solid, wonderful family. They would, they would want to have it tore, you know, this toll trial just tear them apart and, mm. and make them at each other's throats and all of that. You know, you, don't, you wouldn't make these kind of choices. But that's, to me, is the beauty and that's what I love about documentary is, is that real life is always, with the exception of maybe Tennessee Williams, real life is always much more interesting and complex than fiction, um, I think. You're but. really good at the pithy quotes. I'm, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> um, so I'm a soldier of cinema. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can you use that? Because I don't think anybody's ever said that. All right, all right. <laughs> um, so one of the big uh, challenges when you're following an ongoing story is like knowing when to show up and like no, uh, you know, you ne you never want to miss a great moment. Um, in this case, you're based in Chicago. This film is happening in New York. It's spread, I take it, over uh, several months yeah. of, of this unfolding. So how do you make those decisions about when to show up or when to send another camera crew right. or, more importantly, when you can back off? Well, there were, yeah, in this case, you know, I like to do films closer to home for this very reason. Um, I love shooting in Chicago in part because there's so many I think great stories to tell about Chicago, but also because I like being close at hand so that at a moment's notice I can go out. And, and truth be told, this film would have been different if it had taken place in Chicago, without question. However, um, it still worked out, I think, really well, despite the distance here, because we, yes, we did pick and choose sometimes when we wanted to be there, and they were tied to, to different things that were going on and we wanted to make sure we were there. There were also times when I wasn't able to be there, and, and with Julie Goldman, one of the producers on this, and New York-based, and she, you know, she and her team at Motto were our production central for this, and Tom Bergman, who, who shot um, virtually the entire film. Um, you know, we were able to you know, also react, and if there was something going on, they could go and get it. Um, and, and that's, that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, you do have to pick and choose. But, and you also count on kind of serendipity with these things. And, and I found over the years, it's like, if you go, something will happen. <laughs> you know, is that kind of like the Field of Dreams kind of documentary quote? Are, are there other opportunities? OK, we could go, we could go with that. <laughs> Someone tweet that. Um, uh, are there other circumstances where you're trying to like nudge something to happen? I never do that, Tom. No. <laughs> really? Never. <laughs> That's, that would be unethical. Um, no, I think that, look, the, it's, it's not. Like you bring two people together, or you. Uh, we tried to get the DA and, and the Sungs to get together over drinks, but it just didn't work yeah, out. Yeah, that didn't but, seem like it was going to happen. No. But, um, no, I mean, the truth, the, 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 it's not really a dirty little secret among us, but I think most people, you know, who don't make documentaries or follow them that closely would probably be surprised that, yes, documentary filmmakers occasionally try to um, kind of orchestrate things. And to me, there's, that's, a, that's a tricky line. Uh, there are things that I feel are not right and uh, uh, over the line that one might try and do, and I... You know, I, I, and of course, it's, it ends up being me or me and my colleagues' decision about where that line is, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but then there are other things where I don't think it, I think it's entirely appropriate. So it might be like, you know, um, they plan well, like, to... I, I don't know. I'm just going to take a wild yeah. guess. Like, when the sons are watching It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, okay. So great example. Um, we didn't do that at all. No. We... Um, <laughs> We knew that they, we found out that they watched it every year. Well, Mrs. Sung watches it every year. Mr. Sung doesn't watch it as consistently, or might, he might be on the couch dozing off because he's seen it so many times. But, but, um, uh, but we knew that she. It's a she, thing they do. It's a thing they do. She demonstrated this by kind of quoting it chapter and verse to me. Um, 
And we had heard from uh, one of our interview subjects in the community about they, the, he had made that connection to them and, and, and Mr. Sung being you know, George Bailey of, of Chinatown. And so, so I guess I had this idea like, I think that would make a great opening for the film, is to have them on the couch watching the movie. Now, normally they watch it at Christmas time. It wasn't Christmas time. So we took that tremendous poetic license and had them sit there and watch it, and we filmed it. But it prompted them to reflect on it. It and, prompted and, all kinds and, of really great things. It, it That's a great that example. Much. I should be interviewing you about this film. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I've thought about this film. You have. Um, let's uh, go to the audience uh, for some questions. We've got microphones. Uh, that will come to, uh, to you if you put your hand up. I, I see a hand here. We can get this uh, young lady microphone coming your way. There's a lot of people here. Um, hello. They're waiting for Jonathan Demme. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a narrative filmmaker who I actually hear is a nice guy. He is a nice guy. <laughs> he is a nice guy. Sorry to interrupt Sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> No problem. Hi, I really enjoyed the documentary. I watched it yesterday. Oh, thank you. Um, you spoke earlier about um, sort of demonstrating ethical behavior when working with participants, especially if there's like a power differential between the filmmaker and the participants. But do you feel like that same behavior should be extended to those who you don't necessarily agree with the way that they act ethically? Sort of if they exhibit behavior that might manipulate others, if your participant is kind of a questionable character, should that same sort of ethical behavior be extended to them as well as... You mean someone in the film that's acting yes. unethically? Yes. So, um, yeah. Extend what kind of behavior? So you spoke about um, if they wouldn't like something in, if they wouldn't want you to oh. film, or well, also... Like so here's, no, yeah, so here's the thing. With, with, all, with all main subjects of films I've done, um, I've always, starting with Hoop Dreams and through every film, I give main subjects a chance to see the film when I feel like it's nearing completion, but it's not done. It's not like fait accompli at that point. And we watch it. And, and sometimes I've watched it with subjects, and, and oftentimes they want to watch it on their own. Um, and, and then I will meet with them and talk about the film and get their response to the film. And I make it, this is something I make clear well before that point in time, because it is part of the trust building for me, is that you are going to get that opportunity. Um, and, and, and one thing I make clear to them is, is that I'm, I am not giving you editorial control. You have to understand that. But I, I will tell you, and I promise you, and they have to believe me, but I think I make good on this promise, is that I will take very, very seriously what you have to say about the film. Um, to, and, and if there are things that you really think I've gotten wrong, I want to hear it. If there are things you feel like go above and beyond and shouldn't be in the film, let's talk about it. And there are things I have taken out of films as a result of that. And there are things I have said, no, I cannot take that out, and here's why. That's just, and, and, and if you've built the kind of relationship with subjects to do that uh, to beforehand through the making of the film, then you can have that kind of sometimes difficult, com I have found that you can have that kind of sometimes difficult conversations with subjects and still come out of it like, okay. Now, I've had films where it wasn't okay for even a long period of time afterwards, and eventually we got through it. But that's one of the hard things about doing this kind of film that you have to be willing to kind of do, because otherwise then you can't give that control up and you can't go against what you think is true and right and needs to be in the film, but you still need to look. Now, when it, when it comes to someone who's more minor, and, and so I've had to do that with some very difficult, where people have done some things that are wrong, in my view, or, or questionable, or whatever. And well, I've you had, know, I mean, I think about in Hoop Dreams, there's, a, there's a high school uh, basketball coach. Gene uh, Pingator. Yeah. I had that, oh, so that's an interesting example. Uh, so we went and showed it, the Hoop Dreams to Gene Pingator, the St. Joe's basketball coach who doesn't come off entirely positive. He's a coach at a private high school that has that is the kind of dream for these two young uh, players and it's not a great experience. Uh, yeah. And His dreams of winning a state championship uh, tend to override doing what's best for William Arthur, you know. So, I got along great with Pingator throughout the entire filming process. I liked him and I liked him during it and I and I feel like I understood what was going on with him, but he also did and the school did some things that were questionable, clearly. And so at, at a certain point late in, before the film came out, we went and showed it to him in his office. And um, so we're watching it and it's great for the first half hour or so. He's loving it. 
And then it gets to the point where Arthur leaves St. Joe's and Arthur's mother says they didn't care about him. They just, you know, he wasn't a good enough basketball player and that was that and he was out of there. And Gene said, okay, stop the film. <laughs> and he said, that's not right, that's not fair. That's not why, he, he left because his family didn't pay their part of the tuition, that's the rules here, I, I, that's, that's just, not. I said, well, let's keep watching. I said, I, I hear you, but let's keep watching. And then we got to the part where Williams, we find out that Williams' family couldn't afford their part of the tuition either, and lo and behold, they found a sponsor uh, who, filled, who came in and supported that. And that's when we stopped and had a real conversation about it. And it was not an easy conversation, but I, and I just said, Gene, I'm sorry. Um, but I just feel like this is what happened. I said, but let's keep watching the movie because there's a lot of positive things in this movie that show you doing the right thing by way of the kids. And there were some more. Um, and every time one went by, I was like, see that, Gene? <laughs> see how much you care about William's ACT scores? You took him to the test facility. And see this? Look, you're doing that. And look how you're welcoming Arthur back when he came back to visit and how friendly you are to him and you, you know, and how, about how Arthur felt like he wished he could have stayed out there. He really liked you. And so by the end of the film, I'd done such a good job of making him see it differently. He was like, at the end of the film, he was like, ah, I, boy, I'm feeling really good about this. And I realized I'd done too good a job. And so I kind of went, I'm really glad you feel better about it, but you do, I remember saying this to him, because I just did not, I just felt like, I felt like I needed to say this to him. I said, but understand, the film is being critical of you in, in, in some ways, and, and you just need to understand that. And then uh, Frederick Marx, who was one of my partners on the film, was with me, and we walked out of Gene's office at St. Joe's, and I said, take a good look around, we will never be back. And we have not been back. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to face the music. And I feel like, and, and different filmmakers feel differently about this thing about showing subjects films. They feel like they, they, they adhere more to the journalistic ethic thing, journalistic practice of like you do not show subjects films, you do not listen to anything they have to say, you make the film. Blah, blah, blah. I understand that, I understand it. I profoundly disagree with it. Especially in situations where you are in people's lives. Because I think you owe them that. I think you owe, you owe them that. You owe them the chance to see what you've done and face you before it's done. And at least tell you what they think. If you're not going to listen to them, don't listen to them. But you, I think you owe them that. Mm. I feel strongly about that, as you can Great. tell. Uh, I think the microphone is uh, somewhere here. Yeah. Uh, um, so that opening scene, well, right here. Oh. <laughs> the opening scene where they're wa watching It's a Wonderful Life. Um, how long would you spend filming people in a scene like that where you do, I mean, did you sort of plan out what kind of reactions you were looking for and what kind of shots you were looking for? Or, you know, was it, did you stay with them through the whole film? We didn't, we didn't watch the whole film. Uh, we watched, we filmed for quite a while, but we, we, we wanted to watch, we wanted to watch enough of it and we wanted to get to the end of it too. And since the film was so familiar to them, we didn't feel like we had to sit there and watch the entire film. But it was really important to mic them both in, it wasn't, we weren't just looking for B-roll of them watching to support an interview, we, which we did do. We were looking, I was hoping it would turn into a little scene, you know, that they would talk about it or say something about it, and sure enough, they did. It's not a big scene, but it's a nice little moment where, uh, and down towards the end, where, where Mrs. Sung says, that, that part always gets to me, you know, I love that part. And we, you know, we did that, um, so we were, you know, yeah, we didn't, for time purposes and their time purposes, we didn't feel a need to make them sit and watch the entire film. But we, we did enough of it to, to, to the point where I felt like we got a real sense of what it was that, that, that appealed to them about it. Uh, we, are you telling me there's a microphone over there? Hi, Steve. I just had a quick question in terms of the editing process. Like, how do you approach? Where do you start? And how do you work with the editor? Uh, also, in terms of like last minute filming, like, do you just take a sound and a cameraman? Or are they, how do you mic people in terms of like, when you have to like run to set and get something. Sure, I tend to work really small. Um, it's generally, at, at least, especially in verite situations, it's, it's never more than three people and sometimes two. Like in recent years, I've been shooting more, which is why my films are not as nice to look at. Um, uh, 
you know, this one is nice because Tom Bergman did a great job on it. But, but I, um, but I, um, it's generally just three of us, meaning it would be a shooter, a sound person, and me, or it's me and a sound person if I'm shooting in verite situations. If in interview situations, if there's a producer involved in there, great, and you know, other help, great, like a real formal sit down interview. And we always, my, and, and in Verite situation, I'm a big believer in getting wireless mics on people and do it at the beginning of the day or whatever. And, and then, you know, I, I, I think people sometimes forget how important good sound is to Verite because they think, wow, I got this really great scene, but you know, I'll just subtitle it or whatever if the audio is not great. And you can do that. But it really it takes away from the power of the scene to have to read subtitles when you if you'd have just put a wireless mic on. Let me ask you, there's scenes where the Sun family are at the big round uh, tables in Chinese restaurants and talking over yeah. each other. How, how are those mic'd? We had mics on all of them. Hmm. Now, we don't always have that oppor opportunity. You may not have the, the wherewithal ability to do that. And I've been in situations like that where you just can't do it. But like, um, you just you just do the best you can. Like there was a, there was a, there was a scene in the interrupters in in a van where Kobe, one of our interrupters, is driving these two brothers along in for a mediation back at the ceasefire office, and the two brothers start to get into it, and they're really like arguing, and they you know really getting into it. And so Zach, who was the producer and sound person, he's laying down in the back of the van behind the seat. He's got a wireless mic on Kobe. He's got. Um, a wireless mic on mom who's sitting in the, on the back bench and on the middle seats he's got a, a boom mic going back and forth between the two brothers underneath like this. And the sound's great there. He did a phenomenal job. And it's so important because everyone's talking over everybody and, and bickering and all of that. And you want, and you want ideally in, when you're putting it together in the edit to be able to have some choice too. When people are all talking over each other like in the songs, you want to be able to kind of pull up you know, if you have the luxury of you want to be able to pull up the person you want to really poke through and, and take down people if you can help. And again, this is a luxury. Most, you know, most situations, though, you don't need to have five mics on you and whatever. You know, you can get by with a mic or two and then the boom. And the boom is really important, too, because you, and that's where having a good sound person who really is deft with, even when you have the wireless mics, to be able to get whatever else is going on. But good sound is vitally important, I think. Um, so another part now, of his edit, question was editing. Edit. You know, so you come back with <laughs> however many hundreds of hours. Um, are you editing as you go? or It depends on the project, but um, because I also edit my films, uh, this particular one I did not because I was busy on this other project <clears throat> and did not and could not spend the time editing on Abacus. But with one other exception, every other film I've done, I've been either the editor or a primary editor on the film which is why the films are so long. Because you're a tall guy. Yeah, and I, you know, I can't, it's, you it's can't, all too precious. To right, me. right. So, okay, you know, and I'm sure there are people out there who go, that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> with this guy's films. But um, on a more positive note, um, I, I, li I, uh, I like working, I like starting the editing during shooting once you've gotten enough you know, well into it. Um, and if I have a co-editor, what they will do then is start to cut scenes. Um, and I will see scenes roughly cut together, and we're still filming. I'm not, I'm not editing, because editing is too consuming. It's, it's too hard for me to shoot and edit at the same time. I can't, it's two different headspaces, and two, editing is consuming. You know, when I get into editing, like any good editor, you will tell you, it's like you don't really want to do anything else but just be in front of that app and just doing it, right? So, so anyway, I will have, often have a co-editor start and edit and then and start editing scenes and then at a certain point when shooting wraps, then I enter the process typically and I will start cutting scenes. But I, I like to be start cutting the movie and as I come to scenes that they have already cut, which is fabulous, I bring them into the cut and do whatever I feel like I want to do with it, and then when I get the material that hasn't been cut, I will cut as well. But I think it's, I think it's really important in general, that, that's just my process, but in important general, I think it is good to get the editing started as soon as you reasonably can, once you've gotten enough stuff to really start that process meaningfully, because it will inform the shooting. 
It, it will inform the shooting in terms of things you needed to get that maybe you didn't get that you thought you got. Um, but it'll also inform how you, and, it'll, and, and to be able to show your DP um, um, what, well, how it's coming together can really inform how they shoot, you know, like, and it can be a way for you as a director to kind of say, I need more of this or that, or like as we go forward, I feel like you're shooting stuff a little too tight, like, can you, let's, let's use more of the lens, you know, I mean, it can be, and it can just inform the ultimate story that you're trying to tell. We have time for only one more question oh, right here. Oh, one more, okay. I talk too much, that's the problem. Hi, um, so first off, um, as a soldier of cinema, I salute you, and, um, <laughs> No, good remark. And um, uh, I'm preparing a doc uh, myself um, as a filmmaker. And I have a question about um, when you're prepare what would you recommend for preparing questions to ask your participants in the film? Like, what's something that I, I know, like, it changes given the subject matter, it may sound like a general question, but what's something you would recommend keeping in mind when you're coming up with questions to ask your participants? Hmm. <clears throat> well, um, I, um, I sometimes will write questions down in advance and I'll put them on my phone now, uh, or I used to write them down and have them in my pocket. Um, but just the act of writing them down would often kind of organize your thoughts about it, and then sometimes towards the end of the interview, I might look and just make sure I hit the, and usually I write topics, not actual questions, like, okay, make sure you're talking about this. Um, I'm, so I think everybody has a different way of doing this. I go into a lot of interviews without ever having even done that, and it just kind of depends on um, on how I am, how plugged in I feel like with what I want to talk about that do I need to even do that or not. Um, but I try to treat, so there are two different kinds of interviews I do in a film and this is true of a lot of documentary filmmakers. I do more, I do more formal interviews that are set up and you know, it's like we're gonna do an interview and you know, I'm gonna look and frame it and all that. And then I do a lot of on the fly interviews um, and a lot of times I do those interviews in the moment. And a lot of times I'll do those interviews, um, some of the best interviews of that kind I have done have happened in the midst of an otherwise really interesting scene. Not, I don't interrupt the scene to go, excuse me, look, can you all stop, I want to ask some question, I don't do that. But there's oftentimes lulls or Something really interesting happens and then something else is going to happen later, but for now, nothing's really happening and I will al always seize that opportunity. I'll give you an example. So from, if you've seen The Interrupters, there's a scene near the end of The Interrupters where Amina Matthews, this interrupter, is sitting on a bench and she's had this, there's this young woman named Capricia. She's had a very difficult time with the entire film trying to reach and Capricia and her are having this it, it turns into an intense argument about Capricia's attitude and all this, and then Capricia stomps off and walks away. And of course, I then I had, I immediately sees that I, I let I I left a reverential amount of time to see her walk off and to see Amina just sort of sit there and take it. And and then I started to talk to her off the cuff about what had just happened. And, and of course, she, I wanted to do it in the moment because I wanted it to be, I wanted what she was feeling right in that moment, and it's a fairly obvious thing to do. Um, but I think in those situations, you just go with your gut about what, what, you're, what you want, you're trying to understand what people are feeling. In more formal situations, then you might plan in advance and hit your topics. But I think it's really important to not have a list of questions and work your way down the list. Because it's, the conver then it's not a conversation, it's an interrogation, in a way, you know? It's like you don't want, you, and, and I try to turn my interviews into a conversation as much as possible. And that also includes sharing things about myself if I feel they're relevant. And of course, when I'm working with my editors or co-editors, it's always funny to be in the edit room, you know, when we're looking for a particular quote or something and we're looking through the interview and we, we, then, you know, they get to me going off on a long ramble like I've just been doing here. And it's like, fast forward, like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Get to the answer, you know, like the person. But I find that those, I find that that kind of dynamic really leads to better responses from your subjects and more candid and more, and, and less interviewee responses. 
So, uh, we're almost <clears throat> out of time, but uh, I'd, I'd love to ask you about the project you're working on now, which uh, I'm personally anticipating. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, um, I'm in the middle of a monster that's mostly all shot now. We, um, I, I live in Chicago, but I live in a community that's literally right on the western edge of Chicago called Oak Park, which is a historic suburb where Frank Lloyd Wright had his studio and built homes and Ernest Hemingway was born. And I don't live in either of those kind of homes. <laughs> but, um, but it's this really unique community that is incredibly diverse um, and incredibly liberal and takes enormous pride in its diversity. Um, and the high school where my kids graduated um, is this huge high school. It's 3,400 students. It's like a little city into itself. And it is a community and a school system that has struggled for decades over an achievement gap of some significance between its white students and its black students primarily, even though there are Latino students there as well and Asian students. So uh, I always, for 10 years, I thought it would be interesting to do a film about a high school that is not a poor public high school on the west side of Chicago or the south side. I've been in those schools and I've filmed in schools like that. Um, to not do a film in a besieged community with no resources and violence, but to do a film in a school that is multiracial in a liberal community that has a, a, a lot of apparent will to succeed and yet is not succeeding to the degree that, that anyone wants. And it's because I think if you strip away the more obvious reasons for these disparities, and they are real reasons, poverty, <laughs> violence, no resource, I mean, those are real reasons. But if you strip those out of the equation and you still have a problem, what's going on? And to me, this, we have this opportunity with this mini, it's a miniseries, it's gonna be long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have an opportunity to, I think, look deeply at um, the underlying causes of racism in America that go beyond poor communities and what's going on there. And we also, and this wasn't what I expected when I went in, Tom. But we, because we followed so many kids, we're follow and this community is all, all, also a, bi a, a magnet for biracial families because of its reputation. So Oak Park has something like six times the national number of biracial mm. families in, in our community. So we're following a number of black kids that span the different grade levels and socioeconomic sphere and family dynamics, single parent, intact family. We're following biracial kids. We're following a couple of white kids. And so I think this is also, we have an opportunity to make a series that's also about identity, and particularly around race, for this generation coming up of kids. Um, and we've got a remarkable group of kids that have, and families of those kids that have allowed us into their lives, and some teachers who have allowed us into their classroom. Does this project have a name yet? We're calling it. We like this title, um, it, uh, we, so I think it might stick. Um, it, it's inspired by Langston Hughes' poem, um, um, at which the final line of the poem is, America never was America to me. And so we're calling it America to me. Because we feel like we have this opportunity to do a, a mini-series about what America is to these young people primarily, but also to the people in this community, a community that is really struggling mightily to live up to its, its values. Well, we have that to look forward to in 2017. We're so proud to present the world premiere of Abacus Small Enough Jail. It's Thank playing so again uh, tonight. Please come. Please. Thank you, Tom, for tremendous support for the film and in general.
<laughs> we are uh, taking a half hour break right now. After that, at 3.30, we'll be here with the Great Big Story team. This is a, uh, new, a new filmmaking initiative that are looking for filmmakers, so I know a lot of you are going to be interested in that. Later on this afternoon, we have Jonathan Demme and Annette Burstein, so I hope you come back uh, in a half hour. Thanks again to Steve James.